In 1923, Colonel Hugh Heasley and his wife came to St. Andrews for the summer. Starting at McAdam Station, Colonel Heasley began shooting a silent movie film that continued throughout the summer. Years later, in 1980, some local residents recorded a commentary describing the film. This has been combined digitally with the film and is included on the YouTube channel Historic Home Movies of St. Andrews. The film began in McAdam Station and proceeded towards St. Andrews, passing Watt Junction and the Shamcook Lakes. It then reached a spur line to the Shamcook Sardine Factory at St. Andrews North Station. Rose McKay Hahn describes the scene as the train passes by. Coming down towards St. Andrews still, we see a double spur, which is the siding which goes down to St. Andrews North, where in 1914, some of the businessmen concerned with the CPR had a large sardine cannery. On the right, there's a small station, which was the Shamcook Station, and now we are seeing some of the buildings of the... Uh, of the plant I was talking about because they had residences for their staff and uh, they brought out a group of young women from Norway to pack their fish and sometimes this area is called Little Norway. All the buildings which you have seen in Little Norway or St. Andrews North as the railroad station was called at that point have now disappeared with the exception of one building and you cannot see in this film the big factory made of concrete which still exists is now used by the Quaker Oat Company. On the right hand corner of the film we see the building which was used as the Shambhu Post Office. I might mention that these buildings were covered with stucco to make them look like uh, adobe buildings. Uh, why? I can't tell you. In 1935, an aerial survey included this image of the residential area. The company was locally referred to as Ken Sarko, Canadian Sardine Company. Oh, yeah. And some of their vessels were Ken Sarko 1, Ken Sarko 2. On May 1, 1913, the beacon described a great factory. Nothing is equal to it in the world for completeness of equipment. This was the aerial view of the actual plant on the waterfront in 1935. Built in the heart of the sardine fishing grounds, easily approached from salt water, with abundance of the finest fresh water in the world right at its door, with the rails and steamship lines of the CPR bringing it into touch with the entire world, with mechanical appointments of the very latest design, and with sanitary arrangements that cannot be excelled, there would seem to be nothing in the way of its success, unless it would be the utter failure of the fisheries or reckless mismanagement. Alas, just over three months later, on August 14, 1913, the Beacon announced that canning works suspended, but expects to resume work in a few weeks. We are glad to be assured by the leading official of the company that the suspension is not likely to be a lengthy one. Sadly, by December 11, 1913, the Beacon had to report, From an unbiased standpoint, it looks probably that the plant with all its accessories, including a refrigeration plant, three hotels, sawmills, and every possible sanitary appliance is on the ground. It is supplied with powerful boats near the weir and prepared to handle immense qualities of seafood. If it does not run, it will be the first time that the principal men behind it were ever beaten to a standstill. The mammoth engine has been stopped, the hum of industry has ceased, and all is quiet in the new town that started a few months ago, full of such bright hopes. Around 1939, Bill O'Neill visited the site 
and recorded more film. Ed Conley, his wife, came to work at that plant. She was from Denmark. Oh, from Denmark. Yeah. Well, I think, what, Quaker Oaks had a place up there eventually, too, didn't they? Mm hmm I think so, Dave, yeah. God, it was all cement, you know. Yeah. Would have lasted forever. Yeah. I was amazed they actually took it down. Mm hmm Well. Who, who spent the money to take it down? Well, I thought it was someone who was going to develop it for lots. That's what I remember at the time. Ed, Ed LeBlanc, wasn't it? Was it Ed LeBlanc? Yeah, I think so. Shipyard out there, too. Yeah. Dick Miriam ran that for a while. Yeah. The only building I saw them blow down was the, the old clown factory, the last one. Yeah. And what, what's that being blown down? They did one of those implosions, one that was standing out there. Mm. They had a terrible time getting rid of it. <laughs> Didn't they ever? Those buildings would have <laughs> still been standing there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they were amazing. Yeah. The amount of money they were spent there was incredible. Sardine carrier. A sardine carrier. Way yeah. back when, because no pump on it, mm -hmm. no radar on it, just straightforward sardine carrier. Yeah, and not one of the, those fellows that worked on there could swim. Oh, no. There mm -hmm. used to be 15 or 20 of them tied up here. Yeah. They'd have to clear customs here to go with the fish plant in Robinston, Maine. And they used to have mittens made for them. They're great big white mittens, like this. And they'd take them, they'd buy them, take them down, have in the salt water, and they get heavy as a as a boat. Nothing would go through them, but they're great big things, and they were they were white, and you couldn't get them in gray because they wouldn't have gray on a boat. A mm. fisherman wanted gray on a boat. Why was that? <laughs> gray and black. Superstitious. Superstitious for gray and black. Gray and black. Yeah. Certain areas were different. I went down to Nova Scotia, a pair of jeans, get wouldn't let me aboard. I said, How come? He says, oh, jeans are bad luck. Find something else to put it on for you. Come on here and leave the jeans in your car. Yeah. Yeah, they were very superstitious. Yeah. yeah. St. Andrew's Point and the Weirs. Mm -hmm. Boys, they built that up now around the point, haven't they? Have they ever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of those weirs is called the grab all because you just catch all the fish. Right. The grab all? The grab all, yeah. yeah. Murray and K. Lord. <laughs> The wharf, so yeah, the wharf. Wharf. Graham and Ann Ferry in the back. See well, the yes, smokestack? Sir. You think it is? Sure yeah. it is. That's a, a way back, isn't the it? The only two days it didn't get in was Tuesdays and Fridays. They so, went to St. John those days. Mm -hmm. It's cold weather there. Look at the water. The back there. Froze. Yep. Look at the frost yeah. built yeah. up in that boat. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. yeah, the winters were more severe back then. One year their uh, dad told me that the uh, bay froze over one morning. They, they skated to uh, Deer Island to go to the dinghy with them. They held on to the dinghy. Deer Island? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was back in the 40s sometime. It would be a sardine carrier, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they've got a bit of a job to do there. The engines were in the back. So the whole forward part of the boat was free to carry the sardines. Look at the frost on the, the on the, or the steam on the river. It must have been some gold. Get her fired up anyway. Going. She's moving. West Stewart used to run one way yeah. back when. Yeah. Raymond Christie used to go with them. Yes. They would go to the weirs and pick up the herring. They would scoop them out. Now they pump them, mm -hmm. and they would take them to fish plants in Lubeck, Eastport, Robinston. I think there's one Campobello, Grand Manan, Beaver Harbor, Black Harbor. That was the days before the herring purseiners. He's got a dirty day to go he there. Sure White has. water. He's going to make ice. They wouldn't walk today anybody like that. No. This is seining a weir off Navy Island by the old lighthouse, showing how it was done in the old days by hand, getting right in the weir and uh, hauling the nets up and scooping the herring out into the into the dories. And it was uh, it was hard work. Well, I'm just looking at that weir. See those poles across yeah. the bottom? They were called ribbons. 
That's the ribbons there on the bottom, and the nets come down to it. Was that Tommy McNichol on the end there? Did the hat turn yeah. up? Yeah, I think it is, yes. I think that might be Tommy oh, there. Okay. Sorry. See, their person is up there. Well, that, They're getting the bottom pursed up. That wasn't Poot, was it? Well, no. that would be West Stewart's brother. Poot. Oh, uh, Elgin. E-L-G-I-N. Nicknamed Pooch. He owned the clam factory. Yep, he did. Yeah. I'm almost sure that Pooch right now. I'm surprised that Bernard Stinson's not. I'm just wondering if that's not Bernard just past Tommy there. Tall and slim he yeah. would be. Looks like a Carson back too there. That's there, doesn't it? Right there. It is, too. It that's is Bill, Car Carson. Bill Carson, yep. Oops, that one. Oops. That's John's father, John. And yeah. Bill's the one built that. He built that uh, concrete boat that was out here in the harbor. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. We did a lot of ice in them old boats in there. Tommy made quite a little bit of money there one year. Yeah. Built a house and or went, had one hauled in, bought a car. And... Yeah. Excellent, we've got a few names in there. Nobody can prove us wrong, I don't well, think. Lots of money around <laughs> again, this is it. <laughs> so when did a sardine become a herring? When it gets a little bigger. <laughs> I don't know where the size was. Boys, there are a lot of sardines one yes, time in life. Rare, really? yeah. That's why they're no herring now, I'm afraid. That's why Persaners knock the devil out of them. Ralph Conley shows up a little later. Maybe maybe it was a weir that, uh, that Ralph owned. So that, that looks like a McNichol to That's me. Tommy, yeah. yeah. I think that that's is Tommy. Tommy. Yeah. yeah, I would say so. You got a good scoop of herring. Sardines. Must have been heavy. Yeah. Oh, that's hard work. There's a knack to it, probably, eh? Like yeah. everything else. Yeah. Are these Lee Williamson's films? Yeah. Yeah. Me. When did he stop and you start? He, he started probably just after the war in the 40s. Uh -huh. And he died in 1969. The, the Saining the Weir here was probably filmed late 40s. His camera and all the films came to me. I think my brother probably had them. And then when I closed down my brother's house, oh, there's Uncle Lee's camera. And oh, here are all the movies. <laughs> That's how they came to me, I think. So did you work on a Weir Clayton at all? No, no. They, uh, they pretty well had their set crews here. And then when I got out of school, I went to work for the government. I've been around a lot of weirs, but I never ever worked the fishery. And there they are, standing up to their, to their knees in herring. Who owned that weir? That weir? I don't know. If they're... Um, Conley's probably had to, some, of some of them. That was uh, down at the point was Colby Lord and Murray Lord had the one there. But you never know. See, Conley's might have owned them, and mm -hmm. Murray and... And Colby fished them for Conley's. Mm -hmm. yet I don't know. I thought Uncle Wes had one there that Probably I thought did. Tommy McNichol worked for him. Might have. See, this is... But... When that comes up to the left, you will see bags piled up. See, bags yeah, of yeah. salt. So. They used to put so many fish in, then they had a shovel, and they would uh, throw salt over the top of them to keep them. Look at the... You even got the branches on the wing there. Yeah. There's the uh, the old lighthouse at the end of Navy Island. I don't know who that is. Uh, that's not uh, Ralph Conley's wife, is it? One down there, was that, would that be Tilly McNichol? Ralph Conley with the hat on. That, that I, I one there is Tilly, I think. Yeah. And that's Conley got the money in it. Yeah. Aren't these good? Just to show how it yeah. used to be done. Yeah. Well, it must have a good bunch of fish, a lot of boats around. Mm. Oh, and there's the old lighthouse mm -hmm. at the entrance to the harbor. CPR Wharf. Yeah. Wonderful shot of the old CPR Wharf. They had a little retail place in there. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother used to work in it, sold the lobster out of the little shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they canned lobster. And, and there's the market wharf with the pontoon and that steep stairway to get up and down. Conley's plant, the Y is missing on the sign. That's a good shot of the plant. See the railroad cars used to come right up beside for loading. Freight cars beside the plant, ready to load up. This looks like a trip that Gordon and Mary and John and Peter took one day from Connolly's Wharf over to the the pound on Deer Island and, and it was a Connolly's boat took us over. Tilly McNichol took us over and back. It was a great day and just went, we went over to look at the pound. Now this, John, John Williamson says this is a trip out to Deer Island to the Lobster Pound. I, been ne I was never to the pound. No, I was never to the pound either. So you can't help me much with this. No. Well, there's Father probably shaking hands with Tilly. But I, rem I remember that trip. It was a lovely day. And there's the pound. Or one part of it. That's where Patcherell have their operations now. And they would feed the lobsters in the pound. They take a great big dory and fill it up with rotten herring like that. Mm -hmm. and one guy would row, the other fellow would shovel her out into the water mm -hmm. <laughs> to feed the lobsters. Yeah, I guess that's what they're getting ready to do. So I don't know how often they fed them, but they took uh, the stinky, rotten old herring, put them down in the dories. One guy rowed, the other fellow had a shovel, and they just rode up the up the pound and shoveled the herring out for the lobsters to feast upon. Mm -hmm.